Hello once again everyone, and welcome back to the Zettel. So, we are now going to go ahead and complete the Chrome file section. Now the good news is, we only actually have two more things to do, and then a bonus thing for me. It's just the first set of two you can actually do in two different contexts. So, if you'll remember in part one, I talked about how the Chrome file is unique in that it can cut by itself. Technically speaking, all thumb grip cuts do this, but in particular, the Chrome has a bit of a benefit that other cuts don't. And that is that it's sort of like a steady cam. What I mean by that, in case you've never seen a Steadicam before, it's a, well, it's a smart gun from Aliens, but it is a platform that comes off of you, meaning that as I move around, it stays stable. The Chrome can still achieve its cutting potential, regardless of what orientation to my body my hands are. As such, this can be used to shorten it. What's really cool about this is the way you shorten it is, it's not by pulling the tip back, though that is an option. And it's not by pulling my arms back, it's instead by pushing my arms more out and or taking a slightly wider or more crooked step while doing so. This kind of like slots it along where it would come down and can really mess with people. Now, the situation in which we're going to use this is going to be first, Eric is going to be doing what we were doing last time, which is we are, he is cutting an over, I am using the crump to bind. So just a quick reminder of how that goes. He's cutting an over, I'm using a crump. I win this and then I hit it. He now knows that is a thing. So what he's going to be doing is, once he sees that I'm using a crump, he's going to direct his blade to resist it. Now, important thing to remember is that resisting the crump isn't about resisting in the middle of the blade, because I can still hit, like if you clear in motion. It's about stopping my tip. As such, this tends to lead people to be a little more high and tip hunty than normal, which if he's in good scales, isn't actually all that dangerous for him to do. So we'll take one step over there right now. So again, the idea is he's cutting, I'm grumping, and now he is resisting this. So to escape it, what I'm going to do is I'm going to shorten my crump before it lands here and take this opening. That should look like so. Now, the trick here is, right now we're doing it stagnantly, so I'm not getting a huge spray. It'll vary depending upon who you're fighting. If need be, this can be a very, very wide step, or it can be a relatively narrow step. The trick is, you still want your crump to look about the same. So this is me doing a wider step against it, which means that I get much more of a spring in and a much more narrow angle when I do attack him. This is me doing as I did before, where we're being a little bit more um, idealized, meaning that I almost have my leg in reserve because he's really biting on my hands going out. Now, what's actually happening? The idea is that I'm kind of putting a set point in my head as to where my crimp is going to end, and it's just ahead of where Eric thinks that my crimp is going to be. So if I make my crimp look like it's going to arrive here, Eric's sword is going to go here, meaning I just need to make sure it arrives here. From there, all I need to do is I keep my hands relatively where they are, I use my pommel to dip that tip slightly with a Dutchback zone, and I step up with my left foot, and I just ride his blade in to hit. The key thing to making this successful is you must keep your shield in front of your head. Don't try to bring your hands down. He'll crack you, as we'll see in a minute. And also, ride his blade. Seriously. It will, at first, it's like, oh, I feel like I'm giving it away or saying one more thing. No. Use it as a guide, because when Eric makes this shape, he is making a perfect channel for me to follow. Sure, I could hit him over here, but that leaves space, and I could miss, and he could move. If I go right where his sword is, even if he starts to parry, I'm still guaranteed to be right in front of him because his torso has to turn. And from here, I can continue to work, as we'll see in a minute. But here's that again. He's overing. I crump, I'm short. I dip and I hit. Now, that may happen on occasion where you have to go around their hands. It's not the end of the world, frankly. Doing it at speed it has never been a problem for me. Let's switch sides. So again, this is with just the over. Whoop, that was a thing. But, again. Sorry, it's so just the over. Uh, just the over against the crumb. Anyway. There we go. And that's why you wear gear when you fence. But anyway. Point being, that's how this particular play works. Now, this same concept can be used against ox. So, again, we're dealing with left ox. So you can deal this with right ox and then he's going into left ox. And that actually can make it a little bit sweeter. So go ahead and go into left ox for Now, the key thing here is you don't want to do this against a stagnant ox. What you'd really like is, I'm making it look like I'm going to crump, and this is why I like to do this from up here. Eric knows what a crump feels like. He's familiar with it. And so when I bring that crump down, he's going to reinforce his arms so 
that now I end up with my tip with his tip at my face and he can just stab me. It's actually not all that hard to do. It's just you have to be confident and know what a crump feels like. So banking on this, because he's shown me he'll do it in some other context, and a good way to test this is to throw a couple overs, see if there's someone that likes to parry an ox. But banking on this, I'm now going to shorten, and then I will take the opportunity underneath his arms. So what that looks like, now I'm here. Now his tip is still going up, so I'm completely safe. The trick is now I have to choose what opening to take. So let's pivot you toward the camera. So there are three openings that you can take here. There is over his arm toward his face, under his arms toward his face slash neck, and then finally the widest one is basically dead on on his chest. Depending upon how wide you spring, you will get one or the other. Most times I find that I get these two. If this is the case, you'll want to uncurl your hands. If this is the case, you want to keep them, well, this is the case, you don't want to uncurl your hands. This one you do, this one you definitely do. So now we'll have you go to the other side, Eric, and I'll show those. So what do I mean by uncurl the hands? If he's just doing an over, I can hit him like this, I just end up in ox myself. But since we may need to reach a little further, if I'm just going in between his hands and his face, same thing. But if I need to go away, that'll mean that his arms are between my face and my sword. That's not a good time, because that means he can hurt me. So instead, I'm going to pull my pommel through so that now I wind to left ox as I thrust. So we'll show those. So I'm ready to cut Eric, who's going to reinforce it. Boom. So this time, I'm just going to go for his face. It's a simple straight line step. I'm safe as can be. Second time, I'm going to go between his arms. I'll go ahead and give myself a little more room. Pull the pommel. Now I'm winding against his arms as I go in, which makes me a lot safer in dealing with what he's going to do. And then finally, if you get way, way to the side, it's the same thing, because now it's just a question of range. And that's how that works. So one more time at relative fluidity, and I'll just take whatever opportunity I get. And we're strong. And of course, you don't always have to unwind. That's how I went between the arms, but I stayed as I was, because I had a good, wide step with it. And I find that the more of a landing you get, the more you'll affect him when they parry. This is very good against people that stand up when they parry. That's where all the fun happens. But the idea here is pretty straightforward. Your crump can now be shorter. Way around it. Everything in this works on this other side, but your thrusts are not going to be quite as stable. Here, my arms are locked together. It's kind of hard for me to mess up. Here, things can happen as you start ball and socketing. I wouldn't really worry about it, but you can still do it. So, next we only have one more play of the crump. This one we will want to switch sides on, which is this time I'm going to cut my crump and Eric is going to go ahead and resist it. He's going to catch me this time, and we're going to talk about what opening is presented to him. So, I'll go ahead and cut the crump initially. You'll just use an over to parry it, right? We're here. If this happens, the opening that is presented anytime you do a crumb foul is this gap. And all he needs to do to fill it is just literally drag his pommel into the hole, and this will just strike me quite badly. As such, anytime you do the, the crumb foul, which is nice because you're trying it every time you do the uh, follow up anyway, is if you feel them leave the blade, your next reaction is always going to be to pull your pommel to your left side. So, to show that again, we're here. The second I feel him leave, just pull your pommel off to your left, and you are okay. This is kind of the just general reaction you're going to do, period. I mean, even if we ended up in a situation where, let's say you caught an ox. So I cut, he catches, the second I feel his tip come down, same exact thing. It's always going to be that exact motion, because that's where the opening is. Even if he's doing this point, with his cut, with his true edge, with his false edge, it doesn't matter. Pull the pommel to the side, you're safe. So, speaking of which, actually, before we, before we finish on that, there was one other bit that I forgot in the shortening of the crimp, which is working. So, we'll do this on the over. Okay. So, I'm cutting a crimp, he's cutting an over, he sees I'm cutting a crimp, and thus he goes to reinforce it. Here, I go to put my thrust, and he starts parrying. Same motion. Just pull your pommel along with that pressure, and you can then get an extra thrust. Or, alternatively, if he does manage to get this tip away, you have other options from there. Again, just Rip the pommel to the outside against any stimulus going this way, and you're pretty much guaranteed to get some sort of effect. Best effect being not getting hit in your face. Okay? So one more time on what I was just talking about, and then we'll go from there. So I'm cutting from you're parrying with the over. Boom, he goes to lead the blade. I defend myself. Maybe I get a thrust, but more importantly, I'm just safe. Now, 
Before we finish off with the Crumpow, because that's all the Crumpow plays from the Zeta, I want to talk about using it in a less big fashion. Because a lot of the times when we use the Meister How, we only think about them as they are written. But, in particular with the Crumpow, you can use it in a very subtle way that I find is also a good way to train it. So, what I like to do is I like to use it out of mind. The basic idea here is, like I said, the Crump can cut independently. What we have been doing up until this point is we've basically been overing, then crumping. Now, I'm already up forward, so I have overed. All I need to do to affect a bind here is I push my thumb forward, and I push my pommel under my arm. Now I can make that little window, and then I can just turn over for a thrust. This works on both sides, regardless of orientation. All I gotta do is just pull that pommel, stick my thumb up, and what's nice about this is because it's all a forward motion in both cases, this doesn't really take a lot of strength out of me, and him resisting with his sword actually makes it easier. Because that ensures that I'm guaranteed to get the crooked angle that I want, and then I get a lot of fun options for things that I can do. Now, when do you employ this? One, it's a very good way to transition from true on true, long edge binding, to now I've got thumb grip. Two, this is very, very good with the Deutschweck zone. So one of the things that I like to do that Eric has fallen victim to quite a few times, unfortunately, is I will, if he's pushing my tip out of the way, from distance, right, there we go, I will dip and then use that little crump to open it up, then take head or arm, things along those lines. It's that little crooked. Another thing that's very good for is, like I said, entering into thumb grip. So most people, when they whine, this is when they'll do the thumb grip whine, as we'll talk about later. But alternatively, if I'm not ready to jump straight there because he's used to me winding up, this little adjustment, now he's dealing with this weird crooked angle, now I can wind up, and then I'm also in turn for all the other crooked stuff that I can do. Big, happy wreath of thumb grip family. So that's the way I like to employ it on a simpler, smaller level. It also works very, very well with one hand. It's just a great thing to have in your toolkit. But otherwise, thank you very much, Eric. That brings us to the conclusion of the crimp foul. It's a very useful cut. The trick is to just keep it simple, let it cut on its own, and we're going to be seeing more of those things when we get to the Zverkow next time I pick up this series. Otherwise, though, thank you very, very much for watching. We'll go over some other techniques another time.